first argument I'd like to review is the cosmological argument. We can formulate it in three simple steps. One, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Well, they're on the screen right here. If you just look over your right shoulder, yes, there they are. And then having once arrived at the conclusion that the universe has a cause, we can inquire what properties such a cause of the universe must have. Now, premise one seems to me to be obviously true, at least more so than its negation. To suggest that things could just pop into being, uncaused, out of nothing, is literally worse than magic. I mean, when a magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat, at least you've got the magician, uh, not to speak of the hat. So for the universe to come into being uncaused, uh, without any sort of cause at all, would be literally to come into being from nothing. And that is surely absurd. Now, wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, Lawrence Krauss has argued that physics can explain how the universe came into being from nothing. But if you press Professor Krauss, he admits that he's not really talking about nothing. He's talking about the quantum vacuum, which is a sea of energy filling all of space. He's not talking about nothing. He himself says, and I quote, by nothing, I don't mean nothing. Nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. H have you read David Albert's review of Krauss's book in the New York Times? Listen to what Professor Albert says. I quote, Krauss seems to be thinking that these vacuum states amount to there not being any physical stuff at all. But that's just not right. Vacuum states are particular arrangements of elementary physical stuff. Krauss is dead wrong, and his religious and philosophical critics are absolutely right. That's your response, that David Albert is a philosopher. Well, that's right, he's one of the most eminent philosophers of science in the world today, and his doctorate is in quantum physics. Dr. Dawkins, you're in no position to look down your nose at a man like David Albert. If you get into a dispute with David Albert about the proper interpretation of quantum physics, well, being he's one of the most powerful experts in the world and would blow your head clean off, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? <laughs> well, do you, Prof? I think that's a good decision. Well, let's go on then to premise two, that the universe began to exist. This premise can be supported by both philosophical argument and scientific evidence. The philosophical arguments aim to show that there cannot have been an infinite regress of events in the past, or in other words, that the series of past events must have had a beginning. Now, these philosophical arguments are fascinating and mind-expanding, but since you're not a philosopher uh, but a scientist, let's pass those by and stick to your area of strength and go on to the scientific evidence in support of premise two. The scientific evidence is based upon the expansion of the universe. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, three cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin, were able to prove that any universe, which has on average been expanding throughout its history, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a much broader multiverse, their theorem implies that the multiverse itself must have had an absolute beginning. Are you aware that earlier this very year at Cambridge University at a conference celebrating Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday, 
that Vilenkin gave a paper entitled, Did the Universe Have a Beginning? in which he surveys current cosmology with respect to this question. He concluded, and I quote, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. He concluded, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. Now, that's a remarkable statement. Vilenkin does not say that the evidence for a beginning outweighs the evidence against a beginning. Rather, he says, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. He writes, and I quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning." End quote. So, Professor Dawkins, do you have any response to this scientific evidence in support of premise two? No. Well, then it follows logically from the two premises that therefore the universe has a cause. Oh, this is where you object. Okay, what is your objection then? So you think that there's absolutely no reason to endow this cause with any of the properties normally ascribed to God. Well, Let's see, let's just think together about what properties the cause of the universe must possess. By the very nature of the case, as the cause of space and time, this entity must transcend space and time, and therefore exist spacelessly and timelessly, at least without the universe. This transcendent cause must therefore be changeless and immaterial, since anything that is timeless must be unchanging, and anything that is material is constantly changing, at least at the atomic and molecular levels. Such a cause must also be beginningless and uncaused, since we've seen there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. This entity must be unimaginably powerful, since it brought the entire universe into being without any material cause. Finally, I think that such a first cause is very plausibly personal. Let me give two reasons for this conclusion. First, the personhood of the first cause is implied by its timelessness and immateriality. The only candidates we know of that could be timeless and immaterial entities are either unembodied minds or abstract objects, like numbers. But here's the rub. Abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. That's part of the definition of what it means to be abstract. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything, and therefore it follows logically that the transcendent cause of the universe must be an unembodied mind. Secondly, this same conclusion is implied by the origin of an effect with a beginning from a beginningless cause. Just ask yourself the question, how else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect with a beginning like the universe? If the cause were a mechanically operating set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. Once the cause is given, the effect is given as well. To illustrate, the cause of water's freezing is the temperature being below zero degrees centigrade. If the temperature were below zero degrees centigrade from eternity past, then any water that was around would be frozen from eternity. It would be impossible for the water just to begin to freeze a finite time ago. If the cause is permanently present, then the effect 
should be permanently present as well. So, in the case of the universe, how can the cause be timeless and permanent and yet the effect only begin to exist a finite time ago? Well, it seems to me that the only way out of this dilemma is if the cause is a personal agent endowed with freedom of the will, who can therefore spontaneously create a new effect without any antecedent determining conditions. For example, a man who has been sitting from eternity could freely will to stand up, and thus you would have an effect with a beginning arise from an eternal cause. And thus we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. So, on the basis of the cosmological argument, we can conclude that a personal creator of the universe exists, who is uncaused, beginningless, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, and unimaginably powerful. Now, those are certainly some of the properties that are normally ascribed to God. Well, right, the argument doesn't prove this cause to be omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, good, creative of design, or uh, listening to prayers, reading innermost thoughts, or forgiving sins. But so what? The argument doesn't try to prove such thing. Uh, it would be a bizarre form of atheism, uh, indeed not worth the name, which believed that there exists an uncaused, beginningless, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, unimaginably powerful, personal creator of the universe, who may, for all we know, also have the properties mentioned by you. Well, we don't need to call this personal creator God, if you find that unhelpful or, or misleading. But nevertheless, the point remains that a being such as I just described must exist. And you've said nothing to show the contrary.